Hello, I'm Joanna Lumley, and you're listening to Veterans Work, the podcast, a series that explores the myriad of skills and talents that make veterans so valuable in business. Veterans Work, the podcast, grew out of Veterans Work, the UK's leading independent veterans employability campaign. I'm Joanna Lumley, and I support Veterans Work. Hello and welcome to Veterans Work, the podcast. I'm Kate Silverton. In today's episode, we will look at the current state of veteran employment and why it's such an important issue. For that, I'm joined by Brigadier John Mark Lancaster, Baron Lancaster of Kimbolton, former Minister for the Armed Forces and a serving senior officer in the Army Reserves. James Reed, Chairman of Reed Recruitment, Neil Jackson, Veteran and Director of Defence Relationship Management, and Lynn Webb, Veteran and Chief Information Security Officer at the Open University. Let's begin. I'd like to start, if I may, by asking each of you just to introduce yourselves, give us a sense of your your military career and what you have done since the transition, as I might put it. And James, with the exception of you, but I'd like to hear more about how you began in the recruitment uh, world and how you've got to where you are today. So Mark, could we start with you? Well, uh, for as long as I can remember, I always wanted to join the military from being a little boy running around the garden uh, to becoming a cadet at 14. And I fulfilled that ambition by going to Sandhurst at just, just after my 18th birthday and ended up in the Queen's Gurkha Engineers in Hong Kong for two years, which I absolutely loved. Um, I suppose being the son of an eccentric firework-making vicar, I was always destined to become a bomb disposal officer, and this I did during my reserve service. But after operational tours in Bosnia and Kosovo, um, I found myself being drawn to politics. So I eventually got myself elected to be the Member of Parliament for Milton Keynes. And in that career, uh, I suppose I was almost destined to be a minister at the Ministry of Defence, and I served as the uh, Veterans Minister between 2015 and 2017, and then before my retirement at the uh, 2019 election, I was the Minister for the Armed Forces, so effectively the number two in the Ministry of Defence, and it was an enormous honour, uh, and I continue to serve uh, now uh, in the Army Reserve in my 34th year of service. Wow. Well, we will pick up on many aspects of that, not least your father's firework antics. That's intriguing, but we'll hold that thought for now and we'll bring in James, James Reed. Hello, I'm James Reed, and I'm very pleased to be here. So thank you for inviting me in to support veterans' work. I'm not a veteran, so I guess I'm the work part of the equation. Um, And I'm from the Reed family and we're a, a recruitment family. And our business is a family business and it was started by my father back in 1960 in Hounslow with 75 pounds. And we've sort of grown the business organically since then. Um, And our our market message is Love Mondays. And we have a business called Read in Partnership, which helps people who have been unemployed transition into work again. And we have a recruitment business, Read Specialist Recruitment, that supplies temporary staff to companies and organizations up and down the country. I love what I do, and I hope I can help in some way in this discussion. And, and in terms of help, what are your thoughts? Why did you want to come and be part of this today? Well, I think that the military does a fantastic job. I think it's full of fantastic people. I want to help people transition from the military into civilian careers successfully. And we have, we've hired lots of people into Reed over the years, have done that brilliantly. Um, I have a high opinion of the veterans I've met. And um, I think that we can work together to get a better result for people who are making that transition. And I think that's really important. I'm, and I, I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Lovely. And you're going to share lots of practical tips. You've written books on, on how to write the, sort of the CVs and answer interview I questions have. and much else besides. I so I I, we'll look forward to hearing more, James, uh, shortly. But now, Neil Jackson, only your mum, I'm told, calls you Neil. So are we going to go with Jacko? We'll go with Jacko. Yeah, Marvelous. I think that's easier. Yeah. So, I'm, well, I, originally I wanted to be a farmer. But academia sort of defeated me, really. Um, and uh, I ended up uh, spending a bit of time uh, doing that. But then at uh, 22, went to Sandhurst, um, joined the army, joined the artillery, and then spent a fantastic 23 years uh, jumping out of perfectly serviceable aircraft, um, deploying on operations and training all over the world, making awesome friends. And, and genuinely, um, I look back on that time with fantastic fondness in every single element of my time in the military. Um, I left in 2012, 
Uh, I jumped out to uh, not a million miles from the Ministry of Defence. I worked with Capita on the recruiting partnering programme, which was a, uh, an interesting journey for me into the commercial world. But now um, I'm the director of an organisation called Defence Relationship Management, which uh, works with the Ministry of Defence to develop and sustain mutually beneficial relationships between uh, defence and industry and employers across all sectors and public and private. And we really focus on the Armed Forces Covenant uh, as part of that. Uh, that's a key part of our output. And then linked to that is a journey we take um, all of our employers uh, through the Employer Recognition Scheme, which imaginatively starts at bronze, which is a thank you for showing that commitment, and goes all the way through to gold when employers are really demonstrating their advocacy for the Armed Forces community, of which a huge percentage are, of course, veterans. So um, I'm privileged to be here today. And what was it? You said you had you loved your career. What was it then that made you think now is the time to leap? I was really lucky in the transition, as you said, um, process that I was actually approached by someone that I'd known in the military who said, hey, look, there's this um, there's this organisation. They need some subject matter expertise across the areas that I built up during my time in the military. And I looked at it. The stars aligned with children, family and um, geography. And so I, I, I leapt at it. And uh, I don't look back. I do regret elements of having leaving, but uh, but generally uh, it was the right time for me. All right. Well, as you might expect, I might delve into a little bit of that yeah, uh, sure. those feelings on making that leap because it can feel kind of a, a scary place. Maybe not quite as same as jumping out of an aircraft, but there's lots of things to consider. And Lynn, I know you want to talk about that, so let's bring you in now, um, Lynn Webb, and that. I'm interested because I know you're very keen on mentors as well and, and actually having that someone to sort of almost reach out a hand and, and, and bring you over uh, the crevasse as it were. But firstly, tell us a little bit about yourself and your career. So, uh, yes, I, I'm Lynn Webb and um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I was growing up. I think I wanted to win Wimbledon, to be honest. So I loved sport, um, went to university, did more sport, less studying, to be fair, um, and then kind of found my way into the Air Force. Um, and so but that was back in early 90s. Um, and I became a fighter controller, absolutely loved it. Um, and then did a myriad of, of things and, um, and just found it fascinating. And, um, and then I just, for some reason, just had this urge to explore something else. So 23 years later, I, um, I found myself at Deloitte and I came in th uh, as part of their transition scheme. And, um, and I, I ended up um, running teams that work with companies to help companies become more resilient. And, and in, in the face of um, disasters or impending doom, such as a cyber attack or, or even something simple, such as, a, you know, a flood or, or, or industrial action. Um, but the crisis management kind of theme kind of took me further and further into cyber being the thing that everybody was scared at. So, you know, after 23 years, I suppose, of being a security practitioner and, and really taking sort of security for granted, I then sort of switched to a role at Deloitte and then now in my current job at the Open University, where I kind of help organizations become more aware of cyber and just kind of do the right thing. Um, and and, and it's, it's just been fascinating. So uh, that's kind of in a nutshell, you know, 23 years in the RAF, six years at Deloitte, just over a year at the Open University. Okay, all right, well, more on that, particularly on that, that cyber security aspect as well. I'm sure that sort of ears are gonna prick up and be like, hey, I quite fancy that. I know I do, um, and I've got no skills for it. Um, <laughs> But let's begin. We, we, obviously, we're going to talk about where we think the main challenges are for uh, service leavers in terms of um, all the decision making process and then the practical steps to leaving. I just wondered, Mark, if I could ask you, first of all, is there a problem, do we think, in terms of um, service leavers having the support that they might need at the point at which they make that call to think, I need to start thinking about stepping away? I think um, we recognise that all service careers come to an end. By, by definition, there are very few who will have their entire working life within uniform service and that uh, the vast majority will have a second career. And in the main, I think, um, the transition process, which starts far earlier in the armed forces than it does perhaps in other careers, um, has has been a positive experience. But I think because of the nature of uh, of military service, it, it can be a challenge for for some people. I think in recent years um, there have been improvements. 
uh, I think more certainly needs to be done, particularly when it comes to aligning the skill sets that uh, we, we train people for in the armed forces to match them to the civilian world. I think in the past, sometimes we've almost intentionally not aligned those skill sets as a way of trying to prevent people from leaving. But I think as we we move forward, and, and perhaps we'll return to this, looking at the sort of re reserves review that I've done recently, we recognize that if we're going to share skills, we should have a pathway which allows people to move between the armed forces and civilian life, and even potentially back again. Uh, because by sharing those skill sets and encouraging people to, to move their careers, portfolio way that perhaps they hadn't done before, um, we can get the most out of people. So I think it's definitely work in progress, but if you look at the uh, career transition partnerships and other facilities which have been put in place, I think it's no longer is there a taboo about talking about wanting to leave, um, but um, we really do need to work more closely, I think, with, with, the, you know, with the private sector to, to encourage people to, to think more carefully about it and earlier on, recognising that they will leave. And you mentioned the Reserves Review. Are you able to share any of the findings of that? Indeed, it was published last week. But this is really a recognition that, um, I mean, you've talked about cyber, that there are some skill sets which the military need, which are probably best held not in the military, but in, in, the, in the civilian space. Uh, and by smoothing a pathway for people to be able to have full-time uniform service, part-time uniform service, and indeed civilian um, uh, work, but allowing them to move those skill sets seamlessly between the two, there can be mutual benefit for everybody, not just the military, uh, the individual, by making an interesting offer, um, but also to uh, the corporate sector, because of course, if you're a cyber specialist in the civilian world, you potentially will get to do things in the military context you would never be allowed to do in the, in, in the civilian space. And that has to be a mutual benefit. James, you're nodding. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Cyber specialists are very hard to find. And um, uh, we, we recruit them. And if, if there was a sort of blended career opportunity, that could be quite interesting to people. And, and I think a lot of these technologists, you know, they want to be at the frontier of technology and they want to be exploring new ideas and, and, and as Mark just said, if the military offered that, um, that could be quite a good uh, an appealing prospect to people. I think, I mean, just picking up this point about transitions and multiple careers, more and more now, the expectation is in our lives that we'll probably work longer and we might have two, three or four careers. And, and um, we need to get better generally in society at making those transitions from one career to the next and learning new skills. And I think there's a lot more available now with the the massive, or we were just hearing about the open university and the MOOCs, the massive online open courses, and, and, and we have 70,000 courses on our website, that, that you can learn so many new things so quickly that it makes it much more potentially flexible than it was in the past. But transitions are hard. They're always hard. And, and I think you know, helping people in, in clever ways is what we should be seeking to do. Which I will pick up on you in terms of how we can help people. Um, just to speak to Jacko and Lynn then, in terms of transitions, when should we start thinking about the move? Jacko, you've got a particular view on this in terms of how early it should be. I think it should almost be day one. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I mean, one of the things that I learned uh, having left the military and in the commercial space, um, I was... Uh, I was put in front of uh, various chief execs at different times as I was interviewing for positions to, to try and get up the ladder. And the one that really stuck with me was um, a chap that said, right, you've got to look all the time for your next opportunity. And that surprised me. I said, what, what you're going to get rid of me already? You know, is there a, is there a catch here? And, and he said, no, absolutely not. It's about starting early so that you can build your career, but you can also do it for the benefit of the organization that you're in because you remain energized as a result of it. So you're always looking for what's coming next, be that internal or external to that organization. So for the military, for me, I think it is, is starting really, really early because otherwise what you don't do, and I, th I think James's point is absolutely spot on about um, understanding the movement. I mean, I felt when I left, I felt like um, uh, after three or four years, I left the first job I'd gone into post the military and I felt like an 18 year old because when you're 18 or, or just having you know, been a graduate, um, you enter into this space, which everyone did 20, 30 years before, um, where they move around a role two or three times until they find their fit. And I wasn't expecting that. So actually I struggled after at about the three, four year point. That's where I found it really difficult because I wasn't expecting to have to jump around different careers until I found the fit, because I'd had such a good fit in the army for 23 years, 
that actually it was a real challenge then to after three, four years to go, oh, hang on a minute, I'm going to move into something else. Well, well that's a bit, a bit worrying. Interesting. Okay, so take home point on that then is when you leave, which is going to be when for, as you say, Mark, m- m- the majority, perhaps we, we might say, when you leave, don't expect to just get one job and stay there. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a look across the breadth of it. And I think the more we can do, for example, my team run a uh, placements program where we put individuals into uh, industry for a bespoke period of time, usually between six months and a year. Um, but that's about um, understanding skill sets and about mutual benefit of between defence and that industry in terms of understanding how each is approaching it. And everyone I know that's been part of that programme um, has really benefited and they bring really positive stuff back into the military as well as providing that understanding in industry of what it is the military is about because it's often misunderstood. And I, that's something I really want to drill into with all of you is understanding skill sets and how they can be transferable. But just to pick up on a point, it sounds like you had a pretty good mental or, or um, yeah. your senior, you know, because it, I think it takes quite a lot of confidence for a senior, whether it's in management or in the military, to say, be looking around. I mean, hmm. not all of us get managed like that. Can I no, just put I mean, it like that? No, I mean, sort of reverse mentoring uh, yeah. is something which is phenomenally powerful. Having someone that is uh, old, you know, the same age as my, my, my daughter telling me, well, you could have done that better. Now, I get that a lot at home anyway, but that's fine. But, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the professional sense, uh, it really grounds you. And then you look at that team at the lowest level and you say, right, am I really developing, empowering, enabling that team? And I think actually that's something that you learn in the military because every day is a learning day in the military. You're training either for operations or on operations. And when you're on operations, things don't go right. And so you have to adapt and change. And that's a a massive skill set that can be taken forward into the commercial workspace. Great. Lynn, what are your thoughts on that? Um, So in terms of when to prepare, I I think it does depend. Because I think, um, ideally, it's something, on reflection, that you should be sort of considering on and off throughout your military career. I think that puts you in a really good place, but I wouldn't want to kind of suggest that you should go into the military thinking, right, what am I gonna do when I leave? Because I actually think there's a lot to be said about just loving the job you're doing. And I, and I, love, I loved what I was doing, but I do think nowadays in particular, it feels right to constantly be challenging. You know, you must enjoy your job. You won't enjoy it, every aspect of it all of the time, but then actually think about what else is out there. Because sometimes I found that thinking, well, maybe the grass is green and maybe I should go and do something else. Um, often I decided over my 23 years, no, no, I'm, I'm, it's great where I am. And that's a decision in itself, deci- deciding to stay. Because I think when you then come to leave, um, the way in which you approach it to a certain degree will be determined by your own environment, your own context. So I, I genuinely think that if you have chosen to leave because you're really excited about that next step, you know, you've opened your mind, it's a massive world out there, then you go in with that real glass half full attitude and you're, you're thinking, bring it on, I'm ready for you. But sometimes, unfortunately, people have to leave for a range of other reasons. And sometimes there's family pressures and they just want that stability that the military just isn't making possible. Sometimes it may be they're wounded. Um, so there's a range of reasons and sometimes that's really hard. But what I would say is that um, all of those conditions, and when I've kind of worked with people and all of those scenarios, um, having a mentor, or I'd say, you know, a team of mentors, you know, you need your kind of support team around you. When you're in the military, you would gather those people around you to say, help me make the leap. I think so, because I think in the last last 10 years, um, there's been a real improvement in in initiatives from different companies and and, and across lots of different sectors. So there's lots of events that are run by organisations like the Career Transition Partnership. Um, There there are, uh, there's the Officers Association. You know, the recruitment consultancies have great initiatives. Um, And so there's all these networks around there. And you can start thinking, well, okay, who matches my, my situation? And you can even look on LinkedIn and, and shamelessly, you know, look for people who've got a very similar, you know, I, I used to think, God, hallelujah, that person left at the same level as me. Oh my God, they went to the same university and look at what they do now. At the end of the day, 
it's actually really hard to understand what people do in civilian life. Everyone knows what a teacher does, a doctor does, a lawyer does to a certain degree. But what do people who work in banks go in and spend their day doing? What do people that go and work you know, in Amazon go and do? You just don't know unless you happen to know someone. So that, that getting out there and talking to people Build your own consultancy around it. You know, it's use people. <laughs> now, I can almost hear people thinking, well, that's all very well, but I'm not that brave. And it, mm. that sounds awfully like networking. And that's kind of just not what we do. Very, a lot of people, let's just put it like that, may be thinking it's easier said than done. So they get, let's just have a little take home there. So check out all the different websites, whether it's Reads, whether it's yours, Jack, whether it's mm. um, LinkedIn, see what other people are doing, build up a team around you before you leave to say, right, I need your help. I'm thinking about it. And just to go back, and I want to pick up with Mark and James just to follow on from that point, but just hold that thought because I like that idea of the early thinking about transition early. And I'll tell you why, I now work in psychotherapy and counseling children. And from what we learn in our training is from the get-go is you go into it wholeheartedly and you have a connection and there's a relationship in the counseling process, but you are also managing the expectations at some point you're going to be doing this on your own. And so from day one in that relationship, you are having this incredible journey of therapy, but at some point you are gonna go off and fly as it were. And I find that quite a healthy way of being. So it's not saying, right, you're gonna escape the room right now. We need to do some work first, but, and enjoy it, but at some point you are gonna go and it's, it's kind of feels like a healthy place to be. But do you think that's a culture that currently exists? within the military and should it be nurtured a little better mark i think um i mean i think one thing i would say just to add to the to the um conversation is often the grass is greener on the other side if you don't water your own lawn uh, and there is ample opportunity within the military there are a few employers who are prepared to fund you to a level three apprenticeship degree level i think it's degree level uh, you know every every new recruit joining the military is now enrolled on an apprenticeship the, the armed forces are the largest providers of apprenticeships in the UK so before we get to that that point of departure I would encourage you know members of the military as well as having fun just to make sure that they are taking advantage of the in-service training uh, that is available because that is part of the transition process in itself getting those skill sets when it comes to networking um, it is odd, really, because the one thing you do do in your military life is move around and you're constantly on postings, meeting new people uh, and networking and being forced into an environment and out of your comfort zone by, by somehow meeting new people and having to form new friendships the whole time. Some are in, enduring and, and some are not. And yet occasionally there does seem to be um, a nervousness about networking outside the safety of the bubble of the armed forces themselves, where you know immediately that you have something in common with those around you. Um, and I think in many ways, that's why over the last year, for example, when we are used to seeing members of the armed forces uh, serving on operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, actually to see members of the armed forces, both regular and reserve, directly integrating with the community here in the United Kingdom uh, as part of COVID, uh, and to see how well they've done that, um, actually they've been fantastic ambassadors uh, for, for the armed forces, but also I hope those who have done that have found it quite reassuring that they are drawn from the community and very much part of the community, so they shouldn't find this a challenge when it comes to networking more widely outside the military. Brilliant, but maybe we should rename it because networking is always something. Mm. What can we call it in military terms? Oh, don't use a military term, whatever you do. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's the worst thing you we'll can do. <laughs> we'll find a phrase. Go on, then. What are you well, gonna... I, I, think, I think you need a, a, a phrase that makes it easier and calms down that, that fear factor in a, in a veteran's mind because you're right. The term networking is just horrifying. You just think sleazy car salesman and cold calling and, and you think, I can't go and do, do... And people talk about elevator pitch. And, and I always say to people, well, actually... And, and I can't claim that I, you know, I, I was given this advice. Um, so I always say, think of the three things that you want someone to go away knowing about you. you know, and, and, and actually, use your military experience. If you've done something, if you were the first person to do something, or you've been specially selected, you know, I don't know if you're, if you're, you don't have to sell state secrets, but leave something interesting. And then something about 
you know, what you what you currently do and something about what you want to do. And because and, I, I found that that is a form of networking. But also, you know, most of us in the military, I think, as Mark said, were moved around so frequently, we were networking. You know, mm. I, I got dropped into, you know, quite not literally, but I arrived in Basra, you know, the only female working for the Royal Marines. And, and hadn't met any of them at all. And, you know, slight, slightly surreal environment. And, but, but we do it. And you think, well, actually, I got through that. And I, and I got through that pretty successfully. It's a form of networking. So I don't know what the term would be, but it's a way of, I think, for somebody leaving the military, it's all about allowing them to realise, do you know what? You're going to be so successful. We've just got to help you. Um, understand the language to use and actually translate it to think about the activity rather than how it's labelled is yeah. what I would say. Okay, well, go, I'm gonna, we're going to come up with a name. I think I'm, I'm banking on James <laughs> for this one. But So first of all, let me just do a few thoughts that I'm taking away from this. Is, is One is to, I love that, Mark, in terms of all the apprenticeships, focus on getting trained up and enhance your skill set whilst you're working um, uh, you know, in service. And also I was going to ask, how do we know, and this is a human question because it, we all face it at some point or another, how do we know, James, what apprenticeships we should actually be going for? How do I know what I might enjoy and what I might be good at when I leave? And how can I be confident then when I, when I make that transition to sell myself? So two questions really, but just how do I know my own worth and how can I enhance my own worth if I'm not quite sure what I'm good at? Well, that's a very personal thing, isn't it? Every person's different. Every person's going to have different ambitions and desires. And I, and I think having a sort of good degree of self-awareness is a good place to start. And, and, and it was interesting listening to Lynn's points about, you know, going into groups of people that you've not met and, and rising to the challenge. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of struck by how... The, the, the people in the armed forces have done so many varied things and, and, and things that many people would be you know, shocked that you were asked to do or, you know, going to Basra and, uh, and, and they've responded and, and, and done them successfully. And I think that should give anyone leaving the armed forces, I think, confidence that they can go into the next chapter and do well. So I think you, you want to start by a degree of self-awareness and, and feeling good about yourself and what you might do next if at all possible. So um, you talked about psychology and, 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 and um, you know, I think asking for help is so important. And, 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 and maybe that takes some courage sometimes, but being open to new experiences, new ideas, new people's suggestions, I think is so important. And I think it's important wherever you are in life and whoever you are to ask for help and get people around you who, 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 who might come up with some interesting suggestions or things you haven't thought of. Um, I know in my own experience that's been incredibly helpful, but it doesn't come naturally necessarily. So I don't know about networking, but maybe it's about opening, being open-minded, open to new ideas, yeah. open to new people. Um, new openings is what I would be Nice, for. okay. And then when I am open uh, to possibility, how then do I get down to, to sort of selling myself in terms of the recruitment process? We've talked about CVs and, um, you know, actually going in and being interviewed what are the top tips from you on yeah that? Well, well i have written a book about this called why you 101 interview questions you'll never fear again i don't want to plug it shamelessly but i mean a key point you just in, have but that's good have, that's good a, a key <laughs> point in the book which i do want to stress is a job is a problem to be solved so i think you've got to think about that when you're going to a job interview are you a, are you the solution or part of the solution to this organization or this individual's problem because that's what you've got to be to get the job it's not about you, it's, it's about what you can bring. And so, you know, it's really important to go into the process of looking for a job, knowing that a job is a problem to be solved, and to think about what sort of problems do I want to be involved in solving? Mm. Uh, and what sort of problems do I find interesting, you know, and, and stimulating? And, and I think once you've made, have made that thought, you can then prepare. And it's amazing how poorly prepared a lot of people are going into interviews, and they regret it afterwards. And I say to people, you know, when did you last have a life-changing conversation? But that's what a job interview is. It's a life-changing conversation. So if you're, if you're about to go on a job interview or you're looking for a job, you're about to have a life-changing conversation potentially at some point in the near future. Prepare for it. 
Mark, what still isn't happening that you would like to see happen by policymakers, employers, other people that feed into the veteran narrative, such as military charities and the media? Because James, I'll come back to you on this in terms of the perception uh, of the military and, and a service leaver. Well, I think if we sort of roll back a few years, there's definitely been progress with the Armed Forces Covenant, although that's still work in progress because whilst it was, and, and that of course is the principle that um, service personnel should not be disadvantaged because of their service. And whilst uh, that there is a requirement for a report to Parliament every year, it's not enshrined in law, uh, although I'm pleased to see that with the forthcoming Armed Forces Bill that there is a plan to enshrine that in law. That's a really good foundation. Um, and whilst lots of organisations have signed up to that, it's only really when you get down to, dare I say, a desk level, uh, people really understand what that means and, and how that's going to be implemented Will we really see that working properly. I think whilst I was in government uh, as the Veterans Minister at the time, I was the only minister to have veterans in my title, but there wasn't really an understanding that actually every government department uh, has uh, involvement with the veterans, be that the National Health Service, um, be that Department for Work and Pensions. And I think with the creation of the Office of Veterans Affairs, that really does focus different departments' attention as to what their responsibilities are to veterans, uh, and that has been a positive move. The creation of the Veterans Gateway. I think many veterans, when they left, were struggling to know where to turn to get support. So to effectively have a one-stop shop with the Veterans Gateway and then now an app where you can go online and you can get signposted to the support you need is really positive. I think also, though, there is this perception, if I may say, um, not helped at times by the media, where many veterans who were leaving the military, and I think this probably harks back the days of Iraq and Afghanistan when the images were of wounded veterans or people either physically or more importantly mentally, that many people making the transition from military service were in some way damaged. Um, and of course, uh, there were a few cases where people had you know, challenges, uh, absolutely right, and it's right that they get support. But what we never really told the story about was how, I forget the exact figures, but 96, 97 percent of veterans within six months had made a successful transition into work. And I think really changing that narrative that um, the overwhelming majority of veterans are not only fit for work, but will be real assets to your business. Um, that is slowly changing. I've already touched on what uh, the military has done over the last year in responding to the COVID crisis. But I think in time, that is really, really important for society to see the armed forces not just fighting foreign wars, but making a major contribution to the resilience of our nation. Um, that is going to be a really positive, I think, in the future when it comes to veterans themselves making that transition uh, into civilian life, both from a community perspective, but also from their own sense of self-worth and being able to make that transition. Mm. No, I think you're absolutely right. There's a terrible tendency, uh, I have to say, sort of, you know, in my profession, um, that sort of does tend to focus on because it's that sort of, you know, we focus on the negatives mm. all too often instead of actually talking about the success. And it's success that breeds, uh, begets success, I think. And James, what, from your perspective, is the perception maybe that you might want to dispel. Is there a perception around sort of, well, you know, service leavers having PTSD and... That yeah, well, I was of... in sort of preparing for this discussion. I was sort of told that some people have this idea that armed forces leavers are mad, bad and sad. And that was the first time I'd heard that expression. Mm. And that was not my perception. I was sort of quite shocked when I heard that. And I hope that's not a perception that's widely held either in the armed forces or in, in business. And I, since I heard that, I've asked quite a few people who I know who run companies, who employ people, hire people, you know, what's your view of veterans? You know, would you hire veterans? And they either say, oh, I haven't thought of that. Um, and then I say, well, what do you think about it? And they say, well, it sounds quite a good idea or quite interesting. Or they say, yeah, great. I'd, I'd like to hire more veterans. Where, where do I find them? How do I do that? What's the mechanism of doing it? And I think, you know, last year, when you know, the country was in a real crisis, who did they call in to build the hospital? I mean, that says all you need to know. Hmm. The Nightingale Hospital down there was built by the army, as far as I recall. And they're the people who got the job done. So I think that's the perception that is quite widely held. These are people who get things done. We so be yeah, I, I like hiring people who get things done, personally. So why wouldn't you? So we want to actively, I mean, is, is, is the onus perhaps more on employers as well to do a little bit more to actively seek out uh, service personnel, people that want to leave? 
Yeah, I think there's a lot gets lost in translation. Um, you know, the sort of job roles and how you describe them are quite, you, you were saying, what's it like inside Amazon? I mean, the same applies, what, what's it like inside the Gurkhas? I, I mean, I don't know. And, and, and so if you can, if, if there can be more ways of translating and improving the sort of communications between the commercial and armed forces sectors, I think that would help. Jeff, you'd agree? Yeah, I would. I mean, I think, you know, turning back to the, um, the sort of perceptions piece there, I think there's also a perception that um, military equals kinetic in terms of character, not just in terms of going on operations and, and um, you know, releasing weapon systems against, you know, the Queen's enemies or whatever it may be, but, um, but actually in terms of character, that everyone from the military goes around shouting at everybody and it's all very, very hierarchical. It is, but as I, as I touched on before, it is a, it is, um, a learning and training environment that you're in and every day is about improving and learning a little bit more about leadership and I think it's understanding those transferable skills but for those that are leaving I think it's also understanding and I think James's point was spot on about self-awareness uh, and indeed development I mean I as I said before academia not my not my thing but I ended up getting a master's through my time uh, in the army um, which still amazes me to this day but um, the, what but, in? Uh, in defense studies so not a million miles away from, yeah. uh, but you know, <laughs> but, yeah. but still a master's. You know, please. And my. did you seek that out? No, that was that was part of my um, professional development within within the military. That was a program that uh, was on offer for me um, uh, to reach out and grab, which is what I did. And I think that there are a lot more people now within the military who are recognising that there are those skills and those um, qualifications which are accreditable outside of the military. And and for me, that's the big thing. It's about confidence. It's about having the confidence to say, right, what I was doing in that environment in the military equates to that. And that's where it's so important about being self-aware. And, and uh, network is a really tricky word. And um, I actually quite perversely quite like it because it does what it says on the tin. But I've come from a team that's responsible for, as I say, the Armed Forces Covenant Delivery. And those that go on that journey, employers that sign up to the Armed Forces Covenant for all the reasons that Mark um, has already alluded to, one of the key reasons they tell us they sign up is because it's a network of networks. It is a group of similarly minded individuals who understand the type of people that are coming out of the military. They understand the transferable skills and the great you know, people they just are because they are go-getters. They are positive, really upfront people. And I think they add to the bottom line in the business because they land quicker, because they say they're, you know, they're adaptable, as we've heard. So they get their feet under the table, but they, they bed into the team really quickly because that's what they've spent their whole life doing mm. as well. So um, I think per perceptions-wise, without a doubt, there is still um, a degree of that, but I do genuinely believe the 7,000 signatories of the Armed Forces Covenant now, we're getting there. It's growing at about 30 a week, which I'm amazed by. Um, we don't have a business development or a sales team, so that is done by word of mouth. That is employers speaking to other employers, as James alluded to, saying this is the benefit of employing people who are coming out of um, coming out of the military. So I think it is the communication piece. The more people know, the more people will embrace taking those people into their work environment. Yeah, Lynn, you're yeah. nodding. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I think there's two elements. I think we have become as a, as a community, the veterans community, we have become um, you know well thought of you know in in, in out in in the real wide world i think people are aware the good work through you know whether it's the olympics whether it's whether it's in com on, in conflict we've been in the news for quite a long time and even through covid um, and been sort of the saviors of a lot of situations so i think there's that kind of it's doing the right thing i think most employers now say yeah of course we'd support that initiative but i think the real challenge is about how that translates into practical yes. use um, and i think you know james sort of touched on it from a veterans perspective you know what challenges are they wanting to embrace and and how are they going to want to work what problems are they going to solve for an employer in the future in their next career similarly i think there's a lot of work now that needs to be done uh, and continue to be done with um, civilian workforces because I think that um, there are a staggering amount of people who've never met a veteran and they have this uh, perception and it doesn't matter really what that perception is and quite often say well I want to hire a veteran but actually where what would I do with them and I, and I did meet people you know very senior people say do you know what I think you'd be a great fit here but just don't know where I'd you know what would you do 
because they'd see my CV and they'd hear me talk about what I had done, you know. So we don't have any combat aircraft for you to mm. you to control here, and uh, and so it, you have to dig quite deep. And you say, well, actually, you know, you say, you know, this this is what you want someone to do. Well, let me just talk you through some of the skills that I've had to really draw on in the military. And and a lot of it is often get stuff done or really good at organising a bunch of people. Um, I actually, you know, feel that a lot of veterans run towards a fire rather than run away from it and sometimes they love picking up problems that somebody hasn't been very successful at in the past so real problem solvers um and i think having that conversation with an employer is really interesting my my view is is that the work needs to be done a little bit more now with the employer and and that embracing the range of skills that you can get from one the of the military. challenges i think if i may is that um we do speak our own language in the military uh, as many sort of businesses do, and we get indoctrinated by that. And I think there is a disconnect sometimes between the language that the military speaks and the commercial world. And I think one of the real skills is to be able to take your military skills, but uh, convert them into a language which is understandable to the commercial world. And I'm not sure that we're always very good at doing that. And that produces the sort of situation that yeah. I think that, you just described. That, is exactly what I was thinking as, as, as you were speaking, that you almost need a cheat sheet mm -hmm. of the skills that you would have in the military, the things that you've learned, and then what do, how does that translate in the, you know, the world outside? Literally, you could do that on one, you know, an A4 piece of paper, a cheat sheet that just goes, right, if you've done this, this means you can do that. And, and I love, James, what you were saying about, actually, you know, we're very good problem solvers. So what problems, and I was thinking, how would I identify mm. if I was in, and my husband's former, so I'm kind of thinking through his <laughs> eyes, really. How would I identify what I'm good at? Well, actually, and what I enjoy. Well, I would ask myself then, based on what you've said, James, is what problems do I like to solve? And that can almost yeah. then lead you down a path, actually, yeah, I'm really good at that. And if we're really good at something, if we, rather, if we really enjoy something, we tend to be really good at it because we have no problem, you know, push it, putting our energy there. And you've got to do your homework. I think sometimes there is, unfortunately, with a percentage of those who have left, and I feel, having been in that position, I can say this, that you're kind of going to get a role because, you know, I'm, I'm fantastic at what I do, obviously. So therefore, I'm going to land really well. And then exactly as Linda's just said, the first couple of times you don't land well, as I say, you know, I, I went into a slightly dark place having left my first job. I applied for dozens of roles and wasn't getting anywhere. And I was really thinking what was wrong. And then I took, I, I made a conscious decision to take some time off. And over that period of time that I took off, I had a really good close think about exactly what you've just said. But you've got to do your homework. It ain't going to come at you. Mm. You've got to prepare. James's point about those that turn up for interviews ill-prepared. Well, you know, uh, that's the same across almost every walk of life. And it applies to, vet to, to those that are leaving the service and veterans as well. So you've got to do your homework. You've got to prepare and do your research into what it is you want to go into. But ultimately, you've got to try and get into something that you're going to enjoy. Because if you don't, then um, you're just going to bounce around until you do find that fit. As I said, the sort of 18-year-old analogy. But um, you've got to try and find something. But you're not always going to get there first off. Sometimes you have to do the hard yards to get to the good stuff that's around the corner. Yeah, and as you said, Mark, the opportunities are there whilst you're still serving. Bounce around a little bit, go between the different apprenticeships to see what does bring you joy, both you know whilst you're serving and then on the outside. So Mark, just some quick fire questions now in terms of what you see as the main issues, the main challenges around uh, veteran employment. I think it's it, it's making that mental leap from, from, from military service, which is really quite different at times because of the culture of it, uh, to transitioning into the commercial world. And I think you can only do that with proper preparation. And James, I'm sure you'd agree on the preparation side. In terms of the skills, the qualities that veterans have that make them such assets, what are they in your experience? Well, I think many employers would say that they put mindset ahead of skill set when hiring. So they're looking for people with the right mindset. So sort of loyalty, commitment, resilience, they're really important features in a, in a person's character that employers look for. And, 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 and I think you know, many veterans have those qualities in spades. Um, they're also looking for people who are adaptable, responsive, um, who are good with people. And, and I think you know, those are skills that you will learn in the military. 
So, you know, there, there are many qualities that people in the military maybe don't even think they have necessarily or haven't really reflected upon that will be appealing to uh, employers when presented to them as such. I wonder whether we need to drill that home because they sound to me the more, dare I say, softer skills. Do we normally associate that? Well, with I, mean, a... the, I mean, the military is based on values and standards, um, which are, you know, there's a mnemonic for all of them, for sea drills, you know, like courage, respect, uh, you know, integrity, loyalty and self-discipline. Um, which everyone learns from the day they enter into into the armed forces. So, th there is a there, there is an inbuilt set of skills around values, and I think they are often considered soft skills in the workplace. But actually, I think they are hard skills um, because they help an individual work better within a team, which only naturally then provides better results for the employer. Yeah, I mean, I don't like the term soft skills. I think it should be mm. superlative skills because it's what actually we're going to be relying upon, resilience included and loyalty uh, in the com you know in the coming years. I think they they those values are things that drive the culture of an organisation, and I think that a lot of veterans just take them for granted and actually don't realise quite how valuable a commodity something like teamwork or leadership or or caring and nurturing a team uh, they don't realize how valuable those turning those things are time. turning yeah. up on time yeah. and, and and reliability um inquisitive minds and i think if you talk to an employer and i think the veterans work uh, the first the first study the first piece of research was actually saying you know to the employers which skills are you missing you know where are the gaps actually it's a perfect fit yeah. and whose responsibility is this because this is all great but sometimes we're in danger of we we all we all know it we talk about it but who's doing it who is who is fixing the problem of helping to make these transitions easier and shouting about these the the multifaceted mm. nature of um, somebody who's in the services and what they can offer on the outside it still seems there's this well it's a partnership gap. it's a partnership you can't you couldn't just default to the state being responsible it's got to be a partnership between uh, the existing employer, the MOD, the individual themselves, they do have to take ownership of their own career and, of course, the partnership with with, with, with the future employer. Um, it, I don't think it's an easy answer. To, uh, it's, it's not an easy question to answer who is responsible. It's a partnership and mm. it will always be a partnership and there will always be grey areas. I still would like some cheat sheets because I'm a bear with a small brain, right? And if I'm looking, if you were to ask me now, what are your skills? I'd be like, oh, I don't know. I just like talking and I'm curious, um, you know, and how does that translate? I think we all sometimes have a, a, an issue when we do something that we know we kind of like it, but we're not quite sure what it would offer other people. And we can also be a little bit shy about saying, well, I'm really good at doing this. So it's almost like having, for me, I'd want a cheat sheet of like, okay, what are the, what's the, the, the language that I need to understand when I go in to an interview? And also, what are my, you know, oh gosh, these, all these well, incredible the skills that the, I have. And, Thank and, you for sharing. You know, it's, And you pick up on a really important point there, which is the, um, traditionally, there are some uh, who, who break this mould, but traditionally those in the military, they don't sing from the rooftop about, yeah. about what they do is a good thing. They're actually quite humble, um, uh, in, in the largest thing. and I think sometimes you do need to give them a bit of a shake and say all right sing for what it is that you really do let everyone know um, and I think you know picking up on, on James earlier point um, again about self-awareness be aware of what it is you have as a skill set and go go out and sell it and tell it as a story because I always think those examples, oh, well, the time I cooked for, you know, 5,000 and this went wrong and this happened, that's so much more powerful, isn't it? If you're trying to sell yourself rather than just saying, oh, I'm really good at cooking <laughs> or, something, you know, yeah, whatever. Well, if you're asked, tell me about a project you had to manage, you have a great opportunity to tell a story. Hmm. And that's a pretty typical question. And, and project management skills are, are, are very sought after. So, you know, that's something that anyone, in, well, many people in the military, I imagine, will have done a lot of. So I think it's, yeah, it's about communicating in the end. And I agree with Mark, it is a partnership. And, and I think, you know, your cheat sheet idea is a good one. So if we can help in any way, you know, one side of this translation, yeah, we'd be happy to do so. Now, look, we're drawing to a close. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground. So I was going to ask each of you for one point that you would leave everybody with. I'm actually tempted to say, can I have three from each of you? Because I think you've, you've, you've all offered so much. But look, let's just leave with a few thoughts. You can give me one, two, three, as you wish. But just a few final thoughts for people to take away in terms of... Um, how to make a smooth transition. Can we put it like that? Is that is that a good way of putting it? 
Well, I think I'm, I would just return to reinforce the point I made earlier, which is absolutely start early, but seize every opportunity that is given to you, and there are many during your military service to get those qualifications. James. There are an amazing number of opportunities out there, uh, um, many of which you will not know or imagine, and they keep coming up. They, the, the whole world of work's changing all the time. And, and I think it's important to get, get involved as quickly as you can when you leave. And we talk about a job, a better job, a career, because you'll learn from doing things what you really enjoy. And it's important that you do find a job you love, and, and I hope you will. Thank you. Jack. Yeah, scientifically look at, you know, with a scalpel, what you loved doing in the military, and then convert that into doing your homework and finding out where that is available in the civilian in workforce environment and then take that as your first steps? I'd say be, be very open-minded and, and, and go out and explore and, and meet as many people as you can because that, that, that helps you with your support network. And, and, and a lot of the people that you meet while you're exploring will stay with you and support you once you have made that transition and you may have a few bumps in the road and they may be the people that pick you up. But I, I, I would say, you know, getting out there and, and chatting and be curious about it. Thank you then to my guests today, Mark Lancaster, James Reed, Neil Jackson and Lynn Webb. In the next episode, we'll explore the values and purpose veterans share that make them, you, such assets to business. I hope you'll join me then on Veterans Work, the podcast. Goodbye. Thank you.